faster than we do that song, isn't it? We speed it up. I wasn't expecting any feedback. I'm just talking to myself here. <laughs> Did I need feedback? Yeah, um, that was a little faster than when we do that song, isn't it? That's what I was thinking, too. <laughs> All right, that's enough. I'll, I'll take it from here. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I've got to remember if I if I ever kickstart this this thing, it's it, it gets out of control quick. So, <laughs> so just assume that all my questions are are uh, hypothetical from here on out. Okay, and uh, so <laughs> thank you guys for being here. And I do want to encourage you to uh, to plug into Marriage on the Rock. Um, to my knowledge, no one has ever come home from Marriage on the Rock saying, "Boy, that was a waste of my time." And some people come home with monumental change in their life, and some just come home with some, just something fresh in their marriage. And, and at the very, very least, I can promise you it's a day where you're going to have some, some fun fellowship and some, some decent food and, and uh, just, uh, just a day that breaks the norms in your life. And if it can't help your marriage in any way other than just getting out of the house, being someplace new together with some other people, um, with some fresh experiences, it's just, if nothing else, that will give you a, a nice boost, okay? So get signed up and fill those, those last few slots up. It's going to be a blast. And we always tweak it and change it a little bit from year to year. So if you've been, I don't know how many years we've done this. So we're almost, uh, we'll be 20 years old this May as a church. And I don't think we've missed more than two or three years probably doing Marriage on the Rock. So... And it's changed a lot through the years. It's going to be fun, all right? It was a hypothetical question. <laughs> oh, me, oh, my. My, uh, my. my daughter was standing in the mirror this morning, and she had put her hair up in these little wads last night with these little tight rubber bands because if you're a girl, you can relate to this. If If you... If you were born with straight hair, what kind of hair do you wish that you had? And if you were born with curly hair, what kind of hair do you wish you had? Yes, so people with curly hair buy these irons that straighten their hair, and people with straight hair buy perms, and nobody seems to be content. And by nature, just from the natural Asian DNA, you probably don't see a lot of Chinese girls with curly hair, do you? <laughs> It's all long and straight and black, and uh, she loves to try to get the curls going, and she had it all bunched, and she was standing in the mirror, and she, and she, has, to, she has a bathroom of her own, and it's still like little, little yellow ducks and stuff all over thing. I never changed it from when she was a toddler because she just won't use her bathroom. She's really just started using her bedroom the last couple years, and, and uh, she has to use our bathroom for some reason, so I'm always having to shove her out of the way, and She's hogging the mirror, and she's undoing those little rubber bands, and she's getting those curls going. And, and uh, I went to the bedroom, and I got my phone, and I took a couple pictures of her staring in the mirror, trying to get curls in her hair. And, of course, it's like, Daddy, stop it. And, you know, and uh, it's like I'm just trying to capture the moment, capture the moment, because it goes so fast, so fast. seems like just yesterday that, that I was a much younger man than I am now, and and uh, was leaving this wonderful area, heading for a land I'd never been to before. I had never been any further than Myrtle Beach, and that was just one time. And that wasn't to vacation. That was because someone had stolen my older brother's Camaro, and they found it at Myrtle Beach um, with two more coats of paint on it, one with spray cans and one with a paintbrush. And it, it just, it was totaled, man, just, it was, it was such a nice car. And so my dad and my older brother and I went down to pick that up at the police station, turned around that same night and came back. And I had never been any further south than that. And so Florida was a wonderful, uh, wonderful, magical place for me. And um, just the beaches and the palm trees and the, the constant summer, what I called constant summer, and it was just wonderful, and I didn't care about the mosquitoes or anything. And, and when I went down there, my life was such a wreck. And that's why my mom um, insisted, the only way that a mom can, that I pack my bags and leave here. And because I 
was not interested in doing that. She packed my bags for me. Now, for you moms who try a different approach where, where you try to run your house as a democracy and you allow your children to have an equal voice to yours and you try to be your child's best friend first, you just let me know in a few years how that worked out for you, okay? Um, my mom was mom first. And she was the one who heard from God, and she knew what God wanted for my life better than I knew what I wanted for God, from God, because I was a kid. How could I know? Funny enough, it turns out she seemingly was right about all that. And so she packed my bags, and she put them in the car, and she said, here's the date that you're leaving, and you're going to Florida, and you're going to this college, and when you come back, you're not going to be the same. So I didn't want to leave, but I did leave, and... And all the way down, I was just crying the blues and woe is me and all that. But when I got to Florida, it's like, oh, this, this is pretty cool. And I got down there and I found that, uh, that there was a whole new level of partying that could be done in Florida that couldn't be done in West Virginia. And I started discovering the incredible nightclubs in Tampa, especially. We were right next door to Tampa. And, and I found these nightclubs that would be like three levels high with three bands, different styles going on at the same time. And... And it just, like, it was incredible to me. And it's just like, mom, it's like, at that point, I'm thinking, my mom has no idea what she has done to me. She has sent me away from West Virginia for me to get my life straightened out. And she, she said, you need to get away from your friends, and your friends probably need to get away from you. And she sent me to this place where she thought I was going to get my act together. And it was a brand new level of party down there. And here I am on a college campus, a Christian college campus, and most people there were what I called goody two-shoes, man. They'd never sinned a day in their life, which to me meant you guys have never had any fun, have you? And uh, I ended up being the, the st one of those standout guys on the campus that just clearly was like a fish out of water. And I didn't care. I was a rebel. I, I didn't care what anyone thought of me. I had this gigantic stereo that I put in my room. My, my, uh, my roommate just totally freaked out about it and while they're listening to uh to the happy goodmans or whoever they were listening to and i was listening to acdc and black sabbath and, and it's like people when they would walk by my room in the hall they would go way around us and just press against the the wall and i didn't find out till later that man everybody in that dorm was just like interceding for me and praying for me they just thought i was the the, the darkest evilest thing that had ever stepped foot on that campus and the, the the dean there i don't know how many times the dean would call me into his office and say say he called me scotty he said scotty you know we kick kids out of school every year for doing less than what you're doing and they only had to do it one time I said how many times you've been in here and and uh, it just and he would he would say just between you and I God won't let me send you home but you've got to stop some of this stuff <laughs> and I would try to do better and you know how that works the harder you try to do good the more you mess up and uh, when my wife she I caught her eye I guess or actually she caught my eye as I was following her down the sidewalk one day on campus and you want to know more about that story you have to come to marriage on the rock because this is Sunday morning is PG 13 in here and a marriage on the rock is at least R and sometimes we broach other realms that doesn't always uh, leave a smile on my wife's face but she always says well I know for the for for the good of ministry you have to do that so it's all for Jesus and if it builds his kingdom now, I don't know my wife, uh, she was one of those goody two-shoes, by the way, and you know how girls like the bad boy, right? You know, the, the guy that stands out because he's got long hair and he's got a, a wild-looking car and he's playing wild music, and I don't know what she saw or what she knew about me, but for some reason, um, my wife and I just found each other and we began to click. And um, I didn't know till years later that my mom did know what she was doing. Um, God had set me up the whole time, and God's ways are not our ways. And you never know what's going to get your attention and begin to draw you back to the heart of God. And somehow, meeting my wife and beginning to fall in love began to draw me somehow back to the heart of God. And I've shared with you many times this story where I, where I was 
I, I was just wrestling with God one night, just, and it was just, became just exhausted in my soul from running. Now, I knew what it was, I, I never knew what it was like to be on the run from the law. I did know what it was like to try to outrun state troopers from time to time, because I did that on multiple times, and succeeded a couple times, did not succeed more times. Knew what it was like to be on the run from the law, but but this had went to a brand new level of being on the lamb, being on the run from God. And really, I, I mean, if, that's why I love telling the prodigal son story so much. I guess because it just, for me, it's just a very relatable story. And just coming to that place of where you just want to come home, but you're afraid to, and you just, you've messed up so much, and you just, your life is such a wreck, you don't know where to begin to try to get it back on track. And uh, that night, all I knew was I want to come home, I want to come home, and and uh, I, I just, I left my dorm room and um, somewhere between two or three o'clock in the morning and I walked across campus to that big old chapel and it was open and I went up to that big platform and I crawled up on that stage and I just laid down face on my face, man, and I just cried out to God, please take me back. And didn't know how to ask for forgiveness, didn't know how to set the record right, didn't know how to make up for anything, didn't know how to apologize just knew I wanted to come home. And it's funny, you know that God is a good God. Um, you know that in your brain, but your heart doesn't always feel um, that goodness back towards you. That night I, I, I became that prodigal son that came home and the father came running to me and, he, and uh, he scooped me up. And from that night on, something real happened in my life for the first time, something very, very real, something very sincere. And God very quickly began to show me how he brings beauty from ashes and how he makes all things new. And what a great restorer he is and just how his grace was poured out in my life. And it was amazing just a year later, a year later, it was amazing where my life was at because I went from just this being dis a destructive type party person, destructive, to uh, less than a year later, um, traveling in a band for Jesus and... Uh, and writing songs and, and uh, playing in, in places where I was now trying to help draw the prodigals back home. It was not, though, till many years after that that I looked back and I started thinking about what happened that night and how that was so set apart from any other point in my life where um, I came and gave my heart to Jesus. Because I've told you the stories, and, and many of you chuckle because you can relate. Growing up in church, growing up with pretty much every service being a turn or burn sermon, not hearing a whole lot about the kingdom of God, not really hearing too many grace messages, but man, you knew everything there was to know about the devil and a whole lot more that's not in the Bible. You knew everything about hell there was to know because that's what was preached. And so... You know, I had responded to many, many, many altar calls, and for every altar call I responded to in church, there were dozens of times where it was just God and I, as a teenage boy, doing the things that teenage boys do, that you know that when you do that, now you're going to hell if something happens, because Jesus was coming back any second, and if he comes back and there's sin in your life, you're toast. And I would have bad dreams, just I would have so many bad dreams in in, in I mean, I was, uh, I was what I would call a spiritually abused child raising up in church. And, and a lot of people can relate to that. And just my, my dreams would play that out night after night. Just Jesus would come back and I would be left behind because as a teenage boy, I could not keep my life straight. But that night was different. And it wasn't until years later that I looked back and I began to go, hmm, what happened there? Because that night, I was drawn to the heart of God. There was not anyone scaring me with a story of hell. There were no, no devil sermons. There, there was nothing there that, that, that happened just before that to drive me back to God. Something had happened that had never happened before in my life. My heart was just drawn to God for seemingly no reason 
but I didn't think about that at the time. There were things happening in my heart that I had never allowed to happen before, and I found myself in a season just before that, and, and, and if you've ever been in that place of, of, of getting high a lot and being a drunk like I was, you find yourself doing that more and more so you don't think about life. And if, you, and if you've ever had a connection with God, so you don't think about God. And so you don't think about hearing your mama's voice. A million times while you're growing up saying, Scotty, God's got a call on your life. Scotty, God's got a call on your life. God's called you to be a preacher. You're going to be a preacher. You're going to pastor someday. And it's like, no. And so you try to drown it out with alcohol. And uh, I, I, I had plenty of experience of running to God because my butt was in a sling. Oh, my goodness, the last two years before I left here and went to Florida, oh, I was constantly in trouble with the law, constantly in trouble. And it just, I knew every state trooper very personally. They knew me very personally. They had a hit list here in town, and I was at the top of the hit list. And it just, I was always in trouble. I was a destructive person when I started drinking. And when I was getting high, I just, I was a very destructive person. I knew what it was like to come running to God because I'm going to jail. I need you, God. I know what it's like to be sitting in a courtroom facing a, a jury because of stupid things I did with my friends and just crying out, God, please rescue me, save me. I'll serve you the rest of my days. How many times did I tell you that? I promise you, I'll serve you the rest of my days if you'll just rescue me this time. I'm amazed that he kept rescuing me. It's like, this guy's just not taking a hint, is he? And uh, I know what it's like to come to him because you're sick in your body. You're really not giving God the time of day till something bad begins to break in your body and suddenly God, you, he's got your attention now. I know what it's like and I'm not, I'm not, condemning those reasons for coming to God. I'm just saying that was the only reasons I ever came to God. I needed something. I needed him to fix something. I needed him to rescue me. I was scared. Hell was scaring me. End time stuff was scaring me. There were many times that I'd be at church thinking I was okay and something would happen and before the service was over my heart would be like this because Jesus is coming According to the person who just stood up and prophesied, he was coming before that church service let out. You want to know how you get some good stats going with salvation? Just pull that one at least once a month. And I'll never forget the night that it, things were, were brewing in that Pentecostal church. And this little lady stood up and with everything in her, she cried out, Behold, I am the Lord and I come before midnight tonight. It's like midnight tonight. This can't be good. I'm a teenage boy. And I've already sinned three times today that I know of for sure the same sin. Thank you, men. You know what I'm talking about. I come to God for all those reasons. Something different happened that night. Something began to stir in my soul. And I came to God with a sincerity and a desire like I had never had before. And nothing external was happening to make that happen. I wasn't coming to him saying, say, Lord, I'm a wreck. Save me from alcohol. Lord, Lord I, I, I'm a wreck. I'm always in trouble with the law. I'm just, I, I don't, I need you to fix me. Make my life better, please. It wasn't like that. I would just come to him. And in my heart, the only thing that was going on is I want to be in your life again and you to be in my life again so bad. I didn't understand it then. It would be years later before I began to analyze that and realize for the first time in my life I had entertained true legitimate conviction. Everything else was superficial. Everything else was very fear driven or fix it driven. For the first time in my life I had allowed the Spirit of God to come into my life and convict me. And that's all that was going on. The Spirit of God began to draw me, began to pull me. And for the first time in my life, I made a connection with God where something began to happen that would last. 
I didn't become the proverbial dog returning to its vomit as I had many times before. It was different this time. And I wasn't worried about God just breaking my addiction and helping me. I, just, I didn't even worry about that. It's just like, God, I, I, want, I want to come home, Father. And it, it took me years to understand that it was this, the, just the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Now I find myself many years removed from that revelation, realizing that we have a very bittersweet scenario going on in the body of Christ. We find ourselves being a church, generally speaking in the big picture, definitely here at Cornerstone being what I would consider a, a, a forerunner in the body of Christ. It's in the Appalachian Mountains specifically, where we have had a grace revelation and we have been set free from the bondage of the law and all that crushing weight of trying to keep your act together and do right. And when you can't, you're, you're buried under condemnation and guilt and shame. We've been set free from all of that junk. We realize we're righteous. Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so, period. And even though we would continue singing the song, He loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Yeah, He loves me when I'm bad, though it makes Him very sad. And I learned, you know what? I've never done anything He didn't see coming. He, he was emotionally prepared for every screw-up in my life. Not sure much how much He cried from just sudden surprise when I would rebel again. But what I did learn is that when I'm less than good and I'm not bad, I am no less righteous. Because the grace of God and the revelation of that has set me free from the curse of the law. It's a sweet thing. As a pastor, I've seen it's become a bitter sweet thing. Because I have found that that there are people who tow the line and they'll, they will go to church and they will be consistent in church and they will serve and they will tithe and they will have a prayer life and they will get in the Word and they will witness and they will be Christians because they're afraid not to because the law has so just put this noose around them and said this is what you've got to do if you're going to be accepted by God. And you know what? At least physically speaking, people walked it out. And now, for years now, I have pondered this and I've watched this and I've wrestled with this, trying to figure out, now once we get set free with this grace revelation which God wants us to get so bad, if we're set free from the law and we're set free from the things that restrained us because of fear, what is it now that will restrain us after we've been set free from the law. And so my experience has been that there are people who are set free and they move into a realm, a connection with God, where they learn to be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and their life in God goes to new levels, brand new levels. And I find there are many other people who call themselves Christians and they're just tripping over themselves in life. They've been set free with a grace revelation but they have very little restraint in their life. The grace message has given them permission to return back to do things that they used to do because the grace of God covers it all. And because God's grace is so big, there has been, no, there's been a removal of restraints, which means a, a removal of disciplines that used to keep that person in church, in fellowship consistently that used to keep that person in the Word of God, that used to drive that person into a prayer life, that, that, that used to cause that person to, to have thoughts like, the Bible says I need to tithe, I need to tithe. The Bible says I need to serve, I need to serve. The Bible says I need to tell people about Jesus, I need to tell people about Jesus. And the list goes on and on and on. And because our, the external restraint system, we have been set free from it, and people never go beyond just getting the grace revelation. Now, there's no restraint because there is something that has not happened that needs to happen to pull them into a place 
where they begin to operate in a realm called conviction. 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 Conviction is very different than condemnation. Condemnation is driven by fear, guilt, and shame. Condemnation makes me feel like a worthless dog, like I'll never measure up and God is mad at me and he hates me. Conviction is something that supernaturally happens in a person's life where the Holy Spirit is activated in their soul, begins to show them things in their life that needs to change. And instead of the person digging their heels in and say, I'm not worried about that, grace covers all that. Instead, suddenly they find themselves, for no external reason, drawn to the heart of God. Suddenly they're wanting to change something when... Well, why do I need to change? It's not our heaven or hell issue. And that's what I've learned. People have been so set free, they have learned that most of the things that they were told was heaven and hell issues actually are not heaven and hell issues. They're just quality of life issues. And a lot of people have decided as long as it's not a heaven or hell issue, and it's just a quality of life issue, then I'm not going to really worry about it that much. I'd rather struggle and just keep being who I am. the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. It's one of those things that when someday you wake up and you realize that you have been entertaining the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and it's now driving your life, you go, whoa, when did this happen and how did this happen? We wake up and we find ourselves like David and this is, this is one of the, the more powerful things that, that David ever said. And by the way, it comes from uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Psalm 139. It was the chapter that God used to really begin to draw me back with that revelation that in my mother's womb that God knew me. In the secret place, David calls it the hidden place that nobody can see but God. And this is very, very important because he leads to this next statement by preceding with in that hidden place, in that secret place. He said, in that place of darkness that nobody else saw you, I saw you and in that hidden place, in that secret place, in that dark place, I was still, I had my hands on you, and, and I, was, I was developing a life for you. It's after he says that that he says this. He says, search my heart, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts, my anxieties, my stresses. See if there's an offensive way in me. Check my heart, Lord. Show me the areas that I'm offending people. Show me the areas I'm offensive to you. Show me the areas that I'm not just a very good person yet. And lead me in the way everlasting. What a cry. Not out of fear. Not because he needed God to do something. He wasn't buttering God up. He wasn't twisting God's arm. He was in a place a special place where God had just shown him, I'm in that secret place with you. I'm in that hidden place. I'm in that dark place of your heart that nobody else knows about. And David is getting an epiphany saying, oh God, if you know me in those places and you see me in those places, search me in those places. David is inviting the convicting power of the Holy Spirit into his life. And we may read these things and go, well, wasn't that nice what David said? I'm telling you, the line that divides the physical Christian from the Christ-like person that is making a connection with God, the line that divides that is this line. That place where we have opened our heart and welcome, welcome the convicting power of the Holy Spirit into our life. It's not natural, by the way. In fact, it's very unnatural. And that's why Paul says that, that, that we're warring with God, that there's places in our heart and in our mind that's at enmity with God. We don't want God to search our heart. We, we, want, God to, we want God to rescue us. We want God to fix things when they break. We want God to keep us from an everlasting punishment. We want God to guarantee us a gold ticket to heaven. But to want and desire the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in our life. 
So I looked back and I realized that night I had crossed the threshold. And, and, and you know, I, I shared the testimony for years. It's like, I don't know why that night was so different, but it stuck that night. It stuck that time. Suddenly, I wasn't trying to overcome an addiction, but I overcame an addiction. Suddenly, a man who was, who, who was a young man who was filled with fear and insecurity, no confidence on any level, which is why I ended up in alcohol to begin with, because it removed certain fears, and it made me courageous enough to interact in social settings. It's the only reason I started. Because someone told me, you just need to have a couple beers, buddy, and loosen up. So I had a couple beers one night, and, and I loosened up. And a couple beers was a lot for me on that night. In fact, I, I became the proverbial dude with the lampshade on his head after two beers. Two years later, I don't have to tell you, it took a whole lot of drinking all night long to get the same effect. But that night, my whole life changed because something happened I had never done before. I entertained the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, and I was purely purely drawn to the heart of God. So now I understand that one of the things that separates, one of the primary things that separates people who go to church and struggle walking out the Christian walk. Let, let, me, just, let me just be very brutally honest with you um, because this is a year we're going to be honest for better or for worse in, in, in new ways that is going to make you and I both uncomfortable at times. Let me tell you, if you call yourself a child of God today and you are not very interested in attending church on a consistent level, you have not, you have not entered that realm yet with God where, where the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is driving you. Because if you just, just haphazardly attend church and you are constantly missing church because of all kinds of things that, that is non-eternal, and there's nothing in you that's driving you towards fellowship, driving you to the corporate heart of God, and you're not having any issue with it, tells me you're not being convicted, which means you have not put yourself in a place allowing the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. You have not cried out for what God has cried out for. Search my heart, O oh God. Show me the things that I'm not seeing about me. See, we all want to see the things about each other so we can help somebody else. But we don't like it when the mirror is in front of us. And David said, God, put the mirror in front of my face. Help me to see the things that I'm not seeing about me. Very unnatural thing. What, what is it that, you know, you know ironic. I, I, thought I'd pull, I thought about pulling a good one last Sunday and... and and uh, even though those of you that have been here through the years know that I, I'm actually not a person who preaches about money, I'll throw it in every once in a while in a blue moon, a little blurb here and there. But I thought about, man, just, just in case any visitors came to see if it was true, and I thought about doing a good sermon on money last week. Would that have been just awesome timing or what? That went over like a lead balloon, wouldn't it? And someone told me afterwards, and, and they were right on because they grew up in a pastor's home, and, and they said, you, uh, referring to all the people that had kind of, uh, um, uh, had, uh, wasn't real nice to me last week. <laughs> he said, you know, and they were all saying, oh, by the way, I'm a Christian, and I go to this church over here, and, and, and I think they were trying to tell some of you all, that's where you need to come to my church because I've got a better pastor than you've got. It's like, all right, but I bet he's not as good looking as me. But he said, you know, the only, the only churchgoers, and that's the best word to use, the only churchgoers that have a problem with money, he said, you know, are the ones who, are, who personally have a problem with it, right? And they're not givers. You do know that, right? I said, yeah, I know, I know. And I thought about that through the week when it comes to con conviction and, you know, and how you, you know, it's, it's so important not for this church and not for me, but for you to live the prosperous life that God promised you based on his word and nothing else. It's important for you to bring the tithe into the storehouse, the whole tithe in the storehouse. And, and the thing is, you need to do that not out of law, but out of Holy Spirit-driven conviction. You don't need to do it because someone twists your arm. You don't need to do it because, because you think, well, if I do this, it'll be a tenfold, and I need a tenfold, right? You need to do it just because the Holy Spirit and His convicting power drives you to be obedient in those areas. To serve. To serve. Why do we volunteer to serve, and we serve for a few weeks, and then we stop? Why do we volunteer to serve in children's ministry, but we, we are all convinced... 
many are conveniently sick the Sunday we're supposed to serve? Why do we volunteer for things and then never actually show up? Because we have no convicting power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We go to church. We are clean. We've been... We've been emancipated through the power of grace. <laughs> but we've never crossed over into that realm where we've turned our lives over to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit where He drives us because I am not capable of steering this car where it needs to go. You're not like me, but let me tell you how I am. I am always right. I see every flaw in you, and I look back at myself and I go, is it possible that one human being can have his act together this much? Is it possible that, in fact, I am the second return of Jesus Christ, and I just have not come of age enough to really realize who I am? Is it possible? I can't see my offenses. I can't see the things in my life that is preventing me from having abundant life. I can't see those things in my life that's putting a cork in the bottle where the anointing of God is not flowing the way that it needs to. I can't see those things in my, in my life that is interfering with my marriage or interfering with me trying to be a parent. I can't see those things in my life that's keeping me from being the pastor that I need to be. I, I can't see those things on my own because I'm not willing to to look for those things. So if the Holy Spirit doesn't convict me, what do I do? Today I'm, a, I'm your pastor, and today I've been, I've been walking with God for, for 31 years since that night. And it was just a few years ago I woke up and I realized, it's like, wow, I just realized that I never think about heaven, I never think about hell. When there's issues in my life, I pretty much just by faith believe God's got it covered. I'm not a person when something breaks or anything that I call all the intercessors and I call all the prayer warriors and I, and I put it on Facebook. It's like, everybody, everybody, please. I've just always, I've come into a place where I just think God's got this. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. And I'm not saying that you are less than me if you've done those things because I can't judge someone else when they're in a situation when a great weight has dropped into their lap. And we are supposed to pray for each other. And, and, and we need more intercession going on. What I'm saying is I've, I've come to a place in my life where, where I've just relaxed and I don't worry about those kinds of things anymore. And yet I find myself with each year of my life something driving me more and more to the heart of God. What is it that makes you content and say, last year was fine, but it's not enough this year. I want to know you more. I, I need to experience you in ways that I've never experienced. What is it that causes these things to happen in our heart when it's not being driven by fear? Fear won't drive you to a connection with God. What is it that drives one person where they seem to be so hungry for God and another person sits right beside him in church, comes once every six weeks, wrestles every time they give anything to God, always the first to complain about everyone else that's serving, but they themselves never serve. You know, we always thought it was funny, therefore I have no problem calling the Wednesday night sabbaticals anymore. And everyone in the world can get mad at me. I don't care. I need a break myself sometimes. But mostly our teachers need breaks on Wednesday nights. So we found that that January, February break and that July, midsummer break, um, it, it, there's many other good things that can come out of that. But one of the big, the thing that launched it was the fact that we've got to give our teachers a break. Because we have a skeleton crew on Wednesday nights. And you've got to give them a break every once in a while. Because if they quit, we just, we're in trouble. And I noticed that every time I'd say, okay, we're going on a Wednesday night sabbatical, I'd hear through the grapevine people griping about it. It would always just be one or two or three people. And then we begin to notice every person we heard complaining about it has never one single night through the years ever volunteered to help with children one single night. They just come and they get. What is it that allows us to live that way and be okay with it? It's the lack of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you think that I'm launching out a new ground today, I want to draw you back to the first Sunday this year, which was three weeks ago today. We missed a Sunday in there, didn't we? And I told you, here's your word. 
for the year. Last year, the word was servitude. I said, give me one year and serve like you've never served before. See where you're at at the end of the year. And if you will do that, I'll bet you you will never throw that in reverse and go back to the way you used to be. And there were some people that accepted that challenge. By the way, there were many who was doing that before. I didn't even have to ask. This year, I told you that the word that the Lord has dropped in my spirit is the word solitude. Solitude. So here's how you connect these dots. I have learned that unless people are entertaining the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, their life's going to be a mess. They're going to gossip and they're not going to be convicted. They're going to slander and they're not going to be convicted. They're, they're going to see a need and turn their back and intentionally walk away from it and never be convicted. They're going to be the people who's never convicted about not bringing the tithe in the store. They're going to be the people that's never convicted when they never sign up and volunteer to serve anywhere in the church. They're going to be the people that's never convicted because they, they go to church once in a blue moon. They're going to be the people that's never convicted because they have no prayer life or they're never in the word of God. And there are the people who never find a place of solitude with God. See, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, at least for me, doesn't happen when I'm in the busyness of life. It'll happen. I'll get that little twinge of pain every once in a while. You know, the Holy Spirit will go, uh, shouldn't have said that. Uh, should have done that. Um, but for me, it's the times of solitude. Alone with God. Not asking for anything. Not saying much of anything. Listening. The Bible has terminology for it, and we don't like the terminology because the terminology sounds too secular to us. It's amazing how that something can be launched from the heart of God. The world can take it, put their own twist on it, and now it's tainted. And now we, you know, we're very superstitious as Christians. We saw that with the whole dance thing. You know, dance has always just been a part of, of just um, human culture across the board. It wasn't good or evil. It was just, it was just something that people did. And, um, and, and boy, Hebrew culture just took it to brand new levels. And then uh, the man with the heart among all hearts, King David, took that to a new level, and God made abundantly clear, I like it when you dance for me. But the world took it, and they put their little dirty dance and spin on it, and, and suddenly, well, that's nasty now, and we sure can't do that in church. And it's amazing, the Christians, the uninformed Christians, theologically illiterate Christians who can walk into a place where people are running around a room, you know, white man dancing, kids running around the, 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 the room with banners or something, or someone like Enola who can really dance before the Lord. It's like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. And they're just so offended in their spirit. And I've told you the story before. Years ago, we had a, a, a college ministry at Concord. It's still going on, but we turned it over to Campus Crusade because I didn't have time for it anymore. And we, we, would ha we had so many um, international students coming to church then because... because I could stay in connection with them over there. And uh, there was a little girl, Arlette, man. She was from Trinidad. And, and uh, oh, she could dance. And she would wear these long flowing dresses to church. And we would worship over in the old sanctuary. And she would float around the sanctuary. And boy, it wasn't long at all before I heard just, I heard, I heard people puking. I mean, talking. Oh, I just can't believe that. That's distracting to me. I can't worship. Really? Well, I'm glad you didn't hang out with David because you had never got any worship done hanging out with David. And I heard a couple of people say, oh, I'm just, that's just not right. And I can't believe Pastor Scott's allowing that. And I got wind of it. And now I stood up and I made very, very clear. I waited for a Sunday that she was gone. So let me tell you right now, if you don't, if you can't handle that young lady dance before the Lord. Because she talked to me. She came to me. She said, Pastor Scott, I notice people don't really dance here. She said, but we'll be in worship and just I'll, I'll feel God's presence. And I'll hear, I will hear my Lord say to me, all right, dance for me. And she says, when I hear that voice, I have to do it. I said, baby, you dance. You dance. And if they can't handle it, they can go in the other room till you're done. And I told the people on Sunday, I said, if you can't handle 
that handmaiden dancing before the Lord. Don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out. We do that with things. Well, this other thing is very similar. It's something that David talked about with consistency. It seemed to be the thing in his life that he inserted that really took him to that level of intimacy with God that we all know we should have. And he called it meditation. A dirty word. Because meditation, of course, and I won't try to do it today because I'll need four strong men to come unwrap me if I do. That's when we sit and we cross our legs and I'm not sure what's going on here, but we're doing something with this and we've got incense going and of course we're going um. Um, because, of course, that's what meditation is because that's what the world did with it. So that is now officially what it is, right? It couldn't possibly be what God said it was. If you need a word that will help you a little better, we'll give you the word ponder. David said, and I can, let me paraphrase here. He said, Lord, as I, as I lay on my bed at night in my quiet time, in my still time, I ponder you. I think about you. I think about your ways. I think about how you do things. I think about the plans you have for my life. I think about you. If you were here the first Sunday of the year, I think everybody was in agreement that we're all way too busy for that now. One of the sons of Korah wrote a psalm, and he said this, and it's very familiar, and I love it. I, I appreciate that you use this to title that sermon that Sunday. Sean, it was so perfect. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In other words, if you'll be still, if you'll calm yourself, if you'll get alone with me, if we'll follow that pattern of Jesus himself and learn to steal away, get alone with God. Be still. Shut off the iPads. Shut off the iPods. Shut off the stereos. Shut off the TV. Shut off the familiar sounds so you can hear the unfamiliar. The sound that Adam Lost in the garden when he heard God coming. And the Bible says he heard the sound of God in the garden. Solomon said in Song of Songs, the Shulamite woman, which speaks of the body of Christ, who thought she was so, so ugly, and the king is saying, no, baby, you're gorgeous. And he said to her, inside of you, my darling, there is a garden. Interesting. The story of creation, Adam, hears the sound of God in the garden. In your very soul, you know what God sounds like. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and another voice they will not follow. Why are we following so many sick and twisted voices in life? Because we don't know his voice. We've never put ourselves in a place where we know what God sounds like. And so people, especially in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, by the way, we are a charismatic church in case you were just wondering, whatever that may mean. We believe in a personal interaction of the Holy Spirit with us. And God flows in us and through us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mostly I believe in the cherished part of that with love and giving, which is the greatest gift of all. And I grew up in circles where everybody was always hearing from God. And as a pastor, people are always coming to me saying, saying, well, God told me to do this and God told me to do that. And I know God's ways are not our ways. But you see, I'm still learning his voice. But from what I have learned, I'm kinda, I kind of know if it sounds like God or not more times than not. And people will come to me and say, well, I'm doing this. And why are you doing that? And I say, well, because God told me to do that. And, and my first thought is that doesn't sound like God doesn't sound like something God would tell you. It doesn't sound like to me that God would tell you to divorce your husband at least until we try to work on this thing first. We don't know what God sounds like because the garden representing that still place, that garden, 
that place of solitude. We're not getting in that place with God because we're too busy. And we make special allotments in 21st century America because of who we are, the way that our culture is, and there's nothing we can do about our kids being involved in 25 different things and all these other things we're doing with our jobs, with our recreation, with our exercise, and all these things. Those things have to happen. We don't put ourselves in a position to be still. Isaiah said, those that wait upon the Lord will have their strength renewed. They will rise up as though they have wings of eagles. I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm weak. What should I do, Isaiah? What should I do? Then you need to get in a place where you wait on the Lord. Get still before Him. Be silent. Be speechless. I love, I love that song. Stephen Curtis Chapman. That whole album, Speechless. That song, I actually forgot to tell you, Dan, I wanted you to play it during offering day, and I had the CD loaded and everything, and I forgot to tell you this morning. That song, Be Still and Know That I Am God. It's just a beautiful song. Isaiah is saying, look, you're weak. You're falling apart in life. Be still, man. Go wait on the Lord. Go, go find a place to wait on God. And beyond just waiting on God to give me strength and to fix me, I need Him to convict me because I can't see these things myself. I'm too perfect to see the flaws in my life. And isn't it interesting that when He convicts us, it draws us to a place of desiring change, wanting change, and it's not, being, it's not driven by fears, not any kind of legalism, no kind of mandates, nobody twisting your arm. Suddenly there's this desire to oblige the Holy Spirit, and you're not even sure why. What makes a person run to the heart of God when they no longer fear hell and damnation? What drives us? What drives a person to get involved in the body of Christ and to become very proactive, giving, serving, fellowshipping, worshiping, what drives a person to that place on the other side of the fear of eternal punishment? What drives us? What drives us to give when we don't have to give? What drives us to serve when we don't have to serve? What drives us to pray when we say, well, grace has got it all covered. I don't really pray. What drives us to desire to get in God's word when it's, Really not convenient at this juncture in my life. What drives us to love? What drives us to forgive? In lieu of last week, what drives us to not judge when we have already figured out how we can justify judging? What drives us to want to become more like Jesus and less like ourself? The conviction of the Holy Spirit. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit will not force himself into your busy world. You've got to learn to be still. You've got to learn to get alone with God. A quiet time. Where you say, Lord, search my heart. And then be speechless. I love the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to experience it so you can love it too. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit will be like a warm blanket around your life. It will keep you on track. It will keep you focused. It will soothe the savage beast in you that's going bananas. According to David, it will search out and address the anxieties in life where suddenly you will see God very exalted in those realms. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand with me?
the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But it won't just happen. I grew up hearing stories my whole life of people trying to describe the Holy Spirit. Or in those days, he was the Holy Ghost. And people would try to explain his duties knowing that, of course, the Holy Spirit and God are one. You can't separate them. It's just, it's just it's, it's, it's a side of God that interacts with humanity. And I remember a pastor I had for years, and I've heard it many times from others, but he would say it so much to people. He'd say, you know, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He won't force himself on you. And I heard a, 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 a pastor friend of mine uh, down at the Soul Saving Station in Ahosky, North Carolina, years ago, was one of them that, that, that anointed me and launched me into to ministry. And, and, he, and, of course, he would say it in ways in his congregation that you couldn't get away with in a lot of congregations. He'd say, the Holy Ghost ain't no rapist. And think about that. We're the bride of Jesus Christ. If you have ears to hear, he wants, please hear this spiritually. He wants to inseminate you in places of intimacy with things you can birth in life. How do you have life in the natural? You get pregnant, you have a baby, and now you have more life than you had. God's trying to show us things through those pictures. He wants that quiet place that place of intimacy, Solomon called it the bedchamber where productive things can happen. Please hear this, where love making can happen between us and God. There ain't enough love making going on between Jesus and his bride. And in that place, things happen. And the convicting power of the Holy Spirit begins to launch itself. And suddenly things that we thought was just fine in our life for many years that actually was holding us back, the Holy Spirit can show us now. And we don't feel beat up. We don't feel condemned. We don't feel ashamed. We don't, we're not wanting to run from God because of it. There is something magical happening that's making me want to run to God. What a place of comfort to live in. If you don't mind today, could you, just, could you just reach out and grab someone's hand next to you? I'm going to assume, though maybe it's not safe, so that there would not be anybody here today that who would say, I don't want this in my life. Just, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let me tell you, baby, if the Holy Spirit is not convicting you in your life, you are broke. The only reason you don't know it is because you haven't said, search my heart, oh God. <laughs> so I'm assuming we're in this together. And I pray for us, Lord. Lord, I, I, am not, I am not standing above them in the spirit realm, talking down to them, saying, this is what you all need to do. Lord, I am on that floor with them, holding hands with them. We need you to draw us to this spiritual place that many have never lived in, many visit back and forth. And some of us, Lord, we do it when we remember and then we get busy again and draw us to this place, Lord. Father, there is nothing in our natural being that's going, to, that's going to drive us to what we're talking about. Find in solitude with you, Lord. We look at our schedules and we, we just don't see how it's going to happen. We do it two or three days and then suddenly we're not anymore. So I'm asking you by the power of your Holy Spirit to capture our hearts today. Take this word, draw us to your heart, and, and just, just kickstart something in us. Kickstart in us a desire, Lord, to want to spend some quiet time with you, some still time with you, to wait on you. Kickstart in us an incredible, overwhelming desire to take all the things that 
is keeping us from that and pushing it aside and seeing this as the new priority in our lives. Taking walks with you. Taking drives with you. Sitting on the back deck, just you and us and a cup of hot coffee. Working in the garden. Laying in our bed at night and pondering you. Holy Spirit, drive us to this place of desire that we can grab on to this thing. I thank you for this house, Lord. What a beautiful bride she is. Knowing you love them more than I do, Lord, I can't imagine that level of love because they are my life. And I thank you for them today. Tonight, Lord, as we prepare to come back here for, for a, a teacher's meeting, Lord, some, uh, some would look at that as a, a somewhat insignificant thing and, and just the, the very needs that are in children's ministry. And, but, Lord, I pray that th this would be, uh, just happen to be, uh, and for me, uh, would seem to be a coincidence, but probably not to you. You probably set us up. But, but you would use this as an example in our lives, Lord, how that we can honor the conviction and, 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 and respond to needs and respond to ministry. And that tonight, Lord, that as we go into a new year and we want to take our children's ministry to a brand new level, that you would <laughs> stir in us the passion. Lord, those that have been teaching, those that have not been teaching, but they would say, I need to get involved, I need to do this, that tonight, Lord, as a church family, you would help us go to a new level as adults so that our children can go to a new level for their future. We bless you today, Lord. If you agree with this thing that I have spoke of, that God needs to do in our lives, would you just verbally say, Amen? Amen, Amen Lord. Do this. It is so be it. Jesus, do this work. Give, us, give the Lord some praise, and let's go eat.